Hi, my name is Thomas Maurer. I'm here with Vinicius Apellinario, a PM in the Windows Container team. And we're going to talk about some awesome stuff, how you can actually modernize your existing Windows Server applications using containers and make it super easy using the Windows Admin Center extension. Hey, Vinicius, how are you doing? I'm good, Thomas. Thanks for having me at the show. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk about some awesome stuff uh, you're doing. Um, for the people uh, who haven't really heard about you, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people heard about you uh, in the past, but uh, you recently joined the Windows Container team uh, and you work some on some awesome stuff there. Can you explain to me a little bit more how long you are at Microsoft and what your current role is? Yeah, um, actually, I've been with Microsoft almost 10 years. This is the year that I that marks my 10 year anniversary with Microsoft. Uh, it's funny, it seems recently, but it's, I've been with the Windows Container team for two years already. Uh, wow. And recently, wow. I started working with uh, how can we make the process for IT pros and ops teams to use containers a little bit easier. So you see the result of that in Windows Admin Center today. So we have tooling around how you can containerize applications using Windows Admin Center that makes the process completely easy uh, for those, for that specific audience and so on. Okay, no, that's awesome. So first of all, congratulations to the 10 years you will have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, sorry for the recent, uh, I always say I'm recently joined Microsoft and I just realized that's also two years ago. So <laughs> that is, uh, it feels still like it just happened, right? Well, congrats uh, yeah. on your anniversary. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think I think we met exactly when I joined Microsoft. I think that is yep, when we, we actually did. had this <laughs> awesome stuff. So you're working on some really cool stuff, especially for IT pros and like companies who actually need to modernize their existing work relations. So we actually ask you to join this session. So what are we going to learn uh, today from you? Well, today we are going to show the process of containerizing an existing application. So we're going to show you like some scary stuff like Windows Server 2008 up and running with an ASP.NET application that is up there uh, from uh, whatever customer that is running those types of applications is still on those servers. Uh, and the, pro the problem they have is how can they get out of Windows Server 2008 and still use the latest and greatest technology that is out there today, like containers, for example, and Azure Kubernetes services and so on. So we're going to show that process, but we're going to show that process from the IT Pro perspective, how you take the application, how you extract the application from the running server, how you containerize the application, how you push the application to a container registry, and then from there, how you deploy the application to Azure Kubernetes service. No, that is awesome. I, I mean, I get we get these questions a lot from like a lot of the IT pros out there, right? Um, like a lot of people are talking about containers and actually how you can use them and what what like the great benefits are and so on and so on. But it's always good to have like okay, so now talk about the real stuff and how do I get to use them? And so absolutely happy that we have have you here. Um, but for before we start with that, um, can you probably share a little bit with us like? Just to get us a, like a little bit of a recap what containers are and what the benefits of using containers is. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get started with that. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is if you are an IT pro today, you are probably used to seeing a, a scenario like this, right? A data center, data center uh, full of racks and servers. Um, and it, it's great, especially with hardware virtualization today, uh, we get better usage of our hardware. We get like uh, isolation for the applications on each of the virtual machines. Uh, but the problem with that, that we found out um, over the, the years is that those virtual machines, they are what we call resource hogs, right? They, they still consume a lot of resources uh, for those applications running on those virtual machines. And they are still uh, an entire operating system that you have to manage. Especially with the cloud, for example, how do we uh, describe how we want to compose the applications and the operating system that we're running today? If you want to use infrastructure as code, for example, how do you adapt with virtual machines? Um, and how, and more importantly, how does an application move between testing environments and production environments, which is one of the 
uh, major problems between devs and IT pros uh, over the years, right? Uh, developers go and test the application in the dev environment. When they send it to production, the application doesn't exactly work the same way. Well, there are multiple reasons why that happened, and containers are here to try and solve that problem. Yeah, uh, that's that is like something uh, I, I hear a lot. Like these are like some awesome challenges we are facing, and I'm wondering really how you how you're going to show us how we can fix this. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that was actually a good move. Uh, the next slide. I also like. I know a ton of customers which are um, obviously still using Windows Server 2008 and 2008 or two, and obviously end of end of support end of life basically on support is gone so uh what can they do with these applications and can can containers also help them with that yep uh i think the question customers are facing at this point is if you still have a windows server 2008 application uh how do i keep my business running without disruption right so i need to move away from 2008 but i still need to uh run the applications and the other question is if I'm still using 2008, how can I not only move away from 2008, but also modernize that application? I don't want to simply put it in the next operating system and then just wait for the next end of support yeah. um, and so on. Uh, containers can help with that. And by the way, Windows Server 2008 is already not supported. So if you're still running on 2008, you should be thinking uh, on how to move away from 2008 uh, pretty quickly. Um, so entering the subject of containers itself. So uh, containers, they solve for multiple things, uh, including the things that we've been talking about in the previous slides. Um, the analogy that we make here is with shipping containers itself, right? So that's the reason why containers are called containers is because they have a, uh, they are very similar in nature to containers that we see in shipping containers. Uh, the reason is, uh, over the years, the industry needed to figure out how to transport goods from one place to the other uh, in a way that is standardized for the shipping uh, container or for the ships that are actually moving those goods. Shipping containers are the answer to that. They are a standard uh, way for you to package those goods and then ship it to something else, so somewhere else, and then open the, the, the container and the goods will be there exactly the way the way you, you, you inserted them into the container. Uh, so if you want to move those containers around, you can do that. Uh, when you think about containerization from a technology perspective, it's the same thing. The only difference is instead of shipping goods, we are shipping applications from one place to the other, right? So the major benefit of containers is that they run exactly the same way no matter where you run the container. As long as the service or the container hosts can run that container, the container will run exactly the same way. And that's what we're going to prove today in, during our demo. So uh, going back to the analogy, sorry, Thomas, go ahead. No worries. I, I was just like, this is like makes like the this light bulb go uh, bubble go on here. Uh, this is how we actually get it, like the exact same configuration from one place to another, because that is uh, one of the things you just like said before, one of the challenges, and that is one of the challenges I've seen a lot, is actually getting this application from like a development environment into pre-production and then probably in production, that it actually is always done this exact same way, right? And I think that is now makes 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 my light bubble go on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the reason why an application might not work in production compared to development uh, might be multiple things, configurations on the operating system, uh, requirements for the applications that are not in place on the production environment, and then the list goes on and on and on. With containers, when you package the application along with the container, you describe everything that the application needs in order to run. So that package contains everything, not just the application, right? So uh, major benefit there. Right. So when you move, for example, from your coworkers dev machine to uh, your machine or to your canary or dev environment, uh, your test environment, and then into production, even the cloud, uh, everything will work exactly the same way, right? Yeah. Major benefit that. So it's not just like, oh, it worked on my machine. 
and that <laughs> exactly. So, uh, looking a little bit further on the benefits of using containers, uh, agility is of course one of the main ones because uh, you are not tied to looking into issues when you move from environment to environment. Uh, portability because you can move from even on premises to the cloud, so it doesn't matter like. Uh, if your hypervisor is different anymore, it doesn't matter uh, if your virtual machine has to be uh, backed up or exported in a way to move to the different environment. The container itself is going to run exactly the same way. Density is another one because we're going to talk about the architecture in a second. Uh, we can package more containers into one host compared to virtual machines. And rapid scale because of that, because we have better density and better performance, then you have uh, faster scale uh, options with containers. All right, so let's take a look at the architecture itself. So again, this is what you're probably used to as an IT pro, a rack, a lot of servers, networking, storage, and so on and so on. But let's take a look at the uh, hardware and operating system uh, layers here. This is what we are used to, right? You have the hardware layer, and then on top of the hardware layer, you have the operating system. And with the operating system, you have additional layers inside that we don't get to see, but we know how the operating system behaves. Uh, you have the kernel layer on which the operating system basically um, manages how the applications and the services, they are going to access the hardware, plus a bunch of other stuff that the kernel is uh, responsible for. But mainly for the purpose of explaining containers, the kernel is responsible for managing how the applications are going to access the hardware and managing the isolation between those applications itself. However, they are all sharing the same kernel here. So what we did back in the day with virtual machines was, well, let's create an isolation for the kernel so we can have multiple kernels running and then you have one operating system per application of virtual machine that you deploy. Right. Yep. The problem with that is that you have an overhead for that kernel, right? You have an entire operating system that you have to package, manage. Uh, you have to boot the operating system just like you boot the operating system in a physical machine, uh, yep. right? So with containers, uh, I should have clicked before, but basically you have the kernel space and the user space. That's the uh, nomenclature that we use for those two layers that I was describing. With containers, what we did was, well, we kept the kernel there. So we, you don't have a different kernel, uh, right? It's the same kernel. But then you have the isolation on, of the user mode. So each of the application here has its own view of the user mode and the kernel, right? Uh, when you package an application in a container, you have the same applications and services running in that container. But that container is sharing the kernel with the host, right? Okay. The good news here is, well, if something goes wrong with that container, you don't need an entire operating system uh, to boot it again, or this won't affect the other containers that are running in that operating system. Because in the previous option, if something goes wrong with this application, it will affect the other applications that are sharing that kernel, right? Okay. Here we won't anymore. And the other thing is, if you need to boot a new container, you don't need to boot the kernel again. You yeah. skip all the steps to booting the operating system. And then from a management perspective, it, that's not another kernel and operating system that you need to manage. It's just the container itself. It's one operating system with multiple containers running here. And they are uh, user mode isolated. Okay. Okay. That's pretty. I, I can already like see a couple of awesome things here. So what what you're basically saying is like when we did, uh, we had obviously like in the very early days, uh, we had one physical machine, an operating system on top, and usually we put an application on that. Mm -hmm. And we wanted isolation, right? You don't want to have like five different applications on the same physical host. Um, so we added like more physical hosts, and then they were basically doing nothing over all that time. Yeah. And then. Yeah. We had this cool thing called virtualization, which then allowed us basically to split up the hardware uh, into different virtual servers or virtual machines, yep. um, which had a little bit like, which absolutely was great. And I'm like, that is what we're doing now since years. Uh, but the problem with that always was, as you mentioned, um, we still have all that overhead. Like we mm -hmm. have a still whole operating system. Uh, 
uh, for that, right? And and like obviously, when you move a virtual machine, it takes some time and like all that flexibility, and you need to manage it, as you said. Yeah. Uh, and now, what you're telling me is that I actually can like split up, the, if you will, like use the same kernel and still have isolated applications yeah. running on that operating system. Right. That that that's correct. And uh, from a terminology perspective, some people call it operating system virtualization. Right. Okay. Because uh, it's really like one layer above hardware virtualization, where you are not you you are now sharing the kernel instead of the hardware. Right. Yeah. Um, so I mean, from a uh, resource perspective, management perspective, there are many advantages for using containers here. Yeah. So there, I, I mean, just out of the just saying this, is like it's probably they are very like a lot smaller. So if mm -hmm. I want to copy move them around, I probably don't need that. And I know that you probably like have some other things talking about layering and stuff like that as well. But that they're definitely smaller, so they are easy movable. They're probably taking less resources, so I can put more on um, uh, on one machine to get that density you mentioned, and then also. Uh, they're probably faster by like, spinning up. As you said, we don't need to boot the kernel all the time. Like If we do a reboot, we can just re-spin it up. I mean, uh, I, again, I probably you show me a ton of other things <laughs> as well. But yeah, I'm I'm already a huge fan. <laughs> oh, th that's awesome to hear. Well, let's hope that the demo is even better. So <laughs> let, let's continue on the slides here. Uh, so uh, just to finalize an example, uh, the example for the demo that we are going to use is for a web application. The cool thing here is if you have multiple applications uh, running on IIS, for example, what people usually do is like I have one web server running multiple websites and then even IIS has uh, isolation methods, like for example, application pools uh, that you can run inside of one instance of IIS for multiple sites. That concept is it's not even necessary with containers anymore. You can have one container for each website because they are uh, way smaller. Um, you can isolate and quickly boot a new instance of your website uh, like in a matter of seconds. Um, so even concepts like application pools are not exactly applicable for containers anymore. Uh, you can have one container for each of the websites that you have. Uh, and you still have a better resource utilization for, for your container host. Okay. Now that's awesome. So uh, again, as I said, huge fan. So how do we now take that advantage of containers? Like I know we run a ton of applications. Um, how do we now take advantage of that? Yeah. Okay. Let's get that app containerized. <laughs> All right. So let me switch to my, uh, this is going to be scary for some of you. This is a Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, and this is how we used to run things back in the day. But uh, primarily what I want to show you here is that this is a web server uh, running a ASP.NET web application. Um, I'm going to show you the application in a second. But primarily what I want to run, what I want to start with is that this is a regular uh, web server and very common scenario for, from what, 10 years ago uh, or something like that. Uh, I have my application here deployed, as you can see, as an application called Vinny Beer. Uh, I have a default website, uh, default kind of a, uh, deployment back in the day. This is our application, right? So it's called Vinny Beer. Uh, it's primarily a process for you. One of the things that I do is I brew beer at home and one of, during the process of brewing beer, you have to bottle your beer and then let it sit for a while so it carbonates um, and generates CO2 and alcohol and all the process and so on. So basically what this tool does is it gives you how much sugar you have to add to your beer when you bottle it so it ferments and generates CO2. So let's say, what, what kind of beer you like, Thomas? I'm kind of like, I like ales. Do you have any like uh, an ale or something oh, like that? Let's get a Belgian uh, strong golden ale. I know you're Swiss, but let's get a Belgian strong golden ale. Um, that's, fine. that's fine. Like Belgian beer is fine. I'm just like, have, as a Swiss person, I have difficulties with Belgian chocolate, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the temperature here is in Fahrenheit. Uh, I use Celsius. I know you too, but Fahrenheit, let's say like 75. Uh, oops, 
Fahrenheit. That's like above 70 is uh, good, below 70 is not good. Uh, and usually when we brew beer at home, you're doing like five gallons of beer, which uh, is a lot of beer. Um, <laughs> so basically what it gives you like the type of sugar and then how much you should be adding to your recipe. Uh, so pretty cool tool for uh, whoever uh, brews beer at home. The app works. The problem is it's sitting in a Windows Server 2008 uh, server and we need to move away from that. And in the process, what we want to do is we want to modernize the application, right? Yeah. So uh, there are multiple ways you can start the containerization process. We are going to use one that is probably the most familiar to IT pros out there, which is I don't have a developer to help me, <laughs> right? Uh, when that process happens, basically what you have is you end up with the server that has the application deployed. So your first step in the containerization process is you need to extract the application from that running server. And for doing that, in this case, of course, it will depend on the type of application you have. But for web applications, we have a tool called uh, Web Deploy. Web Deploy can be attached to IIS. There is an installation process out there. So let's show you how we do that using Windows Server 2008 and exactly the same uh, in newer servers as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click my application here. You can see that I have Web Deploy installed. So I have this Deploy uh, menu option and I'm going to click Export Application. The cool thing about Web Deploy is that it's going to um, export not just the application itself, like the files for the application, but the configuration of the application inside of IIS. So if you configured uh, application pool, uh, what version of .NET this application has to use, everything goes in the export process. Uh, as you can see, I have the configuration here and I also have the file system. So all the assets for my application to work, they are already uh, included in here. The next step I have is if I want to add any parameters for the export process. This is particularly important when you have applications that are talking to a database. If you have a database string that connects the application to the database, here is probably something you want to take a look. The reason why is you might be containerizing the application and keeping in, in the same network. So for example, if your application access your database by a DNS name or, or IP address, it will continue to work if you deploy the application uh, on a container on the same place where the virtual machine was. Now, if you move to the cloud and you are moving the database, let's say for example, for a SQL uh, managed instance, for example, here you wanna change that configuration. For example, if you have a database connection string, here's where you would, you would be changing that configuration to the new connection string for the new database, right? Okay, awesome. So yeah. I would actually go out and like, let's say as you like to make this example, if I would create the SQL database in Azure, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. that is already now, I would take that data and put it in there. Yeah, because remember okay. the connection string for the existing server is talking to uh, your, let's say the old uh, connection you need to change the new one. So here's where you're going to export that configuration. So when you import this configuration in the container, it already knows where to talk to. Okay. Uh, we're not gonna do that here. The application doesn't have a database, but just to let you know that this is where you would do that process. The next step is just to specify where the package goes, and then you finish the process of exporting the application. So this is step number one, right? Yeah. Um, the next step is now with the zip file that is generated by this export process, you can start the containerization process itself. So now let's go take a look at our friend Windows Admin Center. And here I have another VM where I'm running Windows Admin Center. Uh, as you can see, I have connection to multiple container hosts. The one I'm going to use to demonstrate the process is this container host 01. And as you can see here, I have an extension in Windows containers called containers, right? So before you do this process that I'm going to show, one of the things you have to do is you have to install this containers extension. If you don't know how to do that, we have plenty of blog posts out there uh, and even our documentation now updated to include Windows Admin Center and how to use the containers extension. 
But basically, after you deploy the containers extension and you target a container host, you can see here that the containers extension will show up and you have multiple options in here. So to quickly describe what we have here, we have container host options, for example, your containers you have running, the images you have running, the networks and volumes available for those containers, as well as some Azure configuration, the Azure Container Instance for running one instance of your container, and Azure Container Registry to storing container images, right? Now, okay. the first thing I wanted to cover for a containers is the images portion, because in a virtual machine world, what you would do is you would install the, or I'm sorry, create the virtual machine, and then you would um, install, initiate the installation process for the operating system, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You insert the ISO file, you go through the steps of installing, and then you configure the operating system, then deploy the application, and so on, and so on, and so on. Yeah. With, with containers, it's a little bit different. Whenever you start, a container, you have to start from a base image. That base image is the instruction on how the container was created. And then all the configuration for the container is already in place. So let's say, for example, we have base container images with just the operating system, like for example, the server server, uh, uh, nano server, or even the Windows image. This is just the operating system. But we also have some other things, like for example, IIS. This one not only has the operating system, but it has IIS already pre-configured in the image. The question is, how do we create those images? How do you create those images? The process, the way it works is you write a instructions file called Docker file, and that Docker file has the instructions on how Docker can go and create the container image for you. If that's just, is that starting to become a little bit scary, don't be because we're going to make that process extremely easy for you. It it feels a little bit like if when I use templates for virtual machines and then I created a template which was like a blank Windows Server, like let's say 2019 image, and yeah. then um, I created one where I took that like template, I created the VM, I installed for example IS on it, and then mm -hmm. I create another uh, template with that. Um, and then the next one would be then one where I have the application inside. Um, so if I really hard was in templating, I think that was that is kind of like how this feels right now. Yeah, the, the analogy works. The only difference is for VMs, you have to manually run the process, do all the configuration, and then you run sysprep at the end, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, with uh, containers, containers, you don't do that. You, you could. But usually the way it works is you write a Docker file with the instructions on how to containerize the, the container, uh, the, the application. And then uh, you run a command called Docker build. And then Docker will run the, the instructions step by step in order to create your container image. OK, so less manual effort. And I can just use basically a declarative way of Correct. defining how it should look like. OK. That makes That's my life easier. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. The problem is, how do I write those instructions and how do I get started with that, right? Yeah. Um, so let's show a few things in here on Windows Admin Center itself. So the first thing I want to show is we have a pool option. And the pool option basically says, well, if you have a container image out there already, it's ready to go and you want to use in this container host, just type the repository here. What is the tag that you of the image, the specific image you want to pull, and then click pull here. If you don't know which ones to use, we have some pre-populated here. Uh, oh. For example, the server core one, or the ASP.NET one, or the IIS one, or the nano server one. Oh, right? nice. Okay. And those tags. Uh, the other thing is, if you are pulling from a registry that requires you to authenticate, here you go. You have the option to provide the URL, the username and password, and you can pull the image from a repo that requires you to authenticate. Okay, so that's actually a good point. Um, you just showed me on the left side in the menu that there is like Azure Container Registry. Um, mm -hmm. Does this mean I can only use Azure registries or can I also use others? You, you can use other. The option here for registry authentication is uh, industry standard for authenticating with whatever registry you want to pull an image from. OK, awesome. And as you can see, like for example, for the common image, if I select one for ASP.NET, for example, you can see that we fill out the information here for you, and the pull option becomes available. 
Nice, nice. Yeah, I really like that one. That is new, right? <laughs> that, that is new, yes. We released uh, kind of recently. Uh, all right, so the next step is if I have base images in place, I can create a new image for my application itself. So let's take a look at how that works. I'm going to click Create New. And as you can see, we have here a Docker file preview, which is the option to give me um, in, uh, the ability to edit a Docker file if I need to. And then I have questions up here that I have that I can respond and I'm sorry that I can answer, and then we are going to create a Docker file for you. So oh, remember nice. that I mentioned like all those instructions you have to know to create the container for your application. Now yep. you actually don't have to know. <laughs> we uh, can create that for you. So okay. all the images you see here, again, they are created from those instructions. But basically, we are going to run those instructions for you. Okay. So let's just start with the process here. The first question we have actually is, do you already have a Docker file and you just want to like rerun the process of creating the application? If that's the case, you mark this option, you provide the path on which your Docker file is located, and we are going, just going to load the Docker file here and you can rerun the process. The next option is what type of application you are trying to containerize. For now, we have IIS web applications. Uh, the reason why we have this drop-down menu is because we will be adding other options here in the future. So keep an eye on updates for, for this extension. But let's say web application. And then what is the source of your application, the application source type? What that means is what kind of assets you have to recompile or to rerun your application, right? Uh, let's say you just have a static web application. Well, very uncommon today, but still a scenario that some customers still use. And all you need for that application is just a folder, right? So in IIS, you go to uh, uh, the configuration of IIS, you point to the folder, and then you have an HTML um, web application run. Yeah. The other option is, let's say you do have help from your developer and they gave you the entire solution for the Visual Studio solution um, for the application itself. If you have that option, click this uh, uh, this option in the drop-down menu and give us the path to that solution, right? What Windows Admin Center will do is we are going to load all the projects that we found in that solution and you can go from there. Now, remember that we mentioned like in this case, we don't have the help from the developers, right? Yeah. Uh, so we went to the server that the application was running and we exported a zip file for web deploy. Okay. So I'm going to mark this option and we are going to browse that server. And I'm going to get the Vinny Beer, the Vinny Beer web deploy zip file, which is the file that we, uh, that we extracted from the server. Yep. And with this configuration, uh, Windows Admin Center has pretty much everything it needs to know. The final thing is, do you know which version of .NET framework you're using? Because this is important depending on how old your application is. If you're running up to like uh, .NET framework 2, you can still containerize the application, but you probably need to run in the 3.5 version of .NET framework, right? If you have a, pro a newer version, you can probably run these two options. Uh, my recommendation here is try the options that we have available. If you see an error, probably changing the .NET Framework version is going to fix the issue for you. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I know I can use the 4.8 because it, it does support um, the 3.5 and some of the other options here. So the latest version works for me. The next step is Let's say your Let's application, say your application in, addition in addition to deploying to itself, itself to IIS, to IIS or whatever, whatever, it, is, or whatever it, is, it is, still requires, still requires you to run some run manual steps, like, like creating, creating a folder, a folder creating, creating a registry uh, entry in the registry, uh, whatever environment variable, although uh, there are some other options here for that. But let, whatever that application requires you to manually perform, you can still do that. Put it in a PowerShell file and then load this Pyre, uh, sorry, PowerShell file in here. You can run additional steps for installing your application using this option. And finally, just to provide the name uh, so you can identify this image, I'm going to type Vinny Beer. I'm going to say this is V1. And then as you can see, the Docker file was created for me in here. 
Ah, uh, that is Everything nice. Everything that is needed for Docker to go and containerize your application was written here for you. Okay, yeah, that is nice. That is like the things I usually go into the documentation, right? Then I copy the the, the stuff and then I start mm -hmm. editing and fiddling around with that Docker file and like mm -hmm. figuring out, okay, how do I now copy all the information in? What do I need to do? How do I run the script again and all that? And so this basically now gives me that Docker file, like basically generates that Docker file for me. Now, my question here, this looks like if I now need to add something to the Docker file? Can I mm -hmm. like still do that? Or is it now just locked like this? Yeah, no, it, well, I'm sorry. I should, I should have kept that open. This part over here is totally editable. Like you can come here and type whatever you want. So okay. you can add it right here. And the other thing is whenever you run this process, so as you can see from the image over here, I already ran this process, right? So let's take a look at the folder on which we inform it where the zip file was. Oh, sorry, it's not on the on this server. Let me do it on this server itself. So file sharing, files and file sharing. Uh, let me go to the folder on which we passed on where the uh, zip file was. As you yep. can see, the Docker file is here. Yep. So now, if you want to use this for whatever else you might need, you can still do that. This is, can be open on Visual Studio uh, Code, Visual Studio. This can be open on a notepad, uh, and you yep. can further add it as, as much as you much want, as you want for, for, for this for Docker file. Okay, so it's not just a Microsoft-only solution. That is, like, the wizard gives you this, and yep. we don't care, like, whatever it is. It's just Microsoft. It's really, like, the normal Docker file standard format, which we can... Take advantage, I can generate that, reuse it, can edit it, whatever. Awesome. That, that is correct, yes. yes. And once you have the image running, there are two things that are uh, interesting to do here. The first one is to run the container, right? So I have the option here to run a container. Um, I can specify or not the container name. We can give the container name for me. The other thing that we didn't touch is Hyper-V isolation. So briefly explaining the difference here is, remember when we talked about the architecture of containers and we said um, we are sharing the kernel. For some environments, sharing the kernel is a security boundary issue. For those customers that don't want to share the kernel, we have hypervisor isolation. So basically what this does is we still use the container technology, but we create a kernel specifically for that container. Okay. It is not an additional overhead from a management perspective, but you, you manage as a container, um, but it is a kernel. So it does add um, some performance, not exactly penalties, but the performance of a regular containers is faster um, than hypervisor isolation. There is uh, some performance considerations there, but compared to a virtual machine, it's still faster, smaller and everything. Yeah, yeah, awesome. The other thing is because we are using the NAT option, the network address translation in this case, um, we are going to map a port from the host to the container. Now, this is not the only way to run containers, right? You can use uh, L2 bridge uh, or other options of layering for your network uh, where the container is going to receive a public IP address. But in this case, we are using network address translation. So I'm going to map the port 8080 of the container to the 80 of the um, of the uh, sorry, the, the container host is 8080 and the container is 80. Yeah, uh, here we have some options, uh, for example, how much memory and CPU you want to allocate for this uh, container. Keep in mind that this option here is not going to use uh, two gigabytes of memory or one CPU. The container is going to use whatever it needs and can go up to this configuration that it's doing here. Okay, so it's a limit, basically, you said. Uh, okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, the other option we have here is, if you are already familiar with Docker and how uh, to run new containers, you know that there are many variables and options for specifying a Docker run command, which run new, new containers. Um, we didn't want to add all those options in the UI. So what we did was we add this option for add and basically what you can do here is specify what is the parameter and the value for that parameter. So if you need to specify a uh, persistent storage or an environment variable or a different network to use, here's where you're going to do that. 
And if you don't know what uh, options there are, you can click here and see the Docker documentation. But basically, uh, with the information that I provided, I can click Run. And this is going to start the process of running, running um, uh, a, new a new container. This should this be, should be uh, uh, finalized in a second. There you go. Our container, Our container is, is up and running. So I can so click containers, containers, just to just double check that the container, container is running. running. Let's, Let's see, see, I have two here, here, actually. Uh, this one was created by the image that we just talked about. And one of the nice things about Windows Admin Center is like that I have some management capabilities for the container here. here. So how so much how CPU, much how much memory, memory. Uh, network I.O., uh, those kind of things that you would expect uh, that an IT pro is looking for in terms of resource, resource utilization, utilization and those kind of things. things. I, have I have some options, some for, options for example, for even for get events event from, from inside, inside of the container. Of the container. And the cool and thing the cool here is that it's, it's very similar to what you are used to in terms of event viewer uh, visualization yeah. for your application. Yeah. Right. Nice. So we've even out like joining somehow some like we're using a PowerShell remoting command or anything like that. We just can easily use Windows Admin Center to to get the logs, get some details, how it's like doing. And it's actually a cool tool to troubleshoot also if you're running a container host and you want to see what. What is the container doing? You can actually use that. Nice. Yeah, that's correct. But this is like for still for your validation, right? Um, you created the image, and you want to check if the image is running properly, right? Yeah. Um, great. Let's do that. The next step now is how do we push this container image to a place where other container hosts can see it and run in those hosts, right? Right. The process here is called push. We are going to push to a container registry. So here what we have is we have the image name and the tag, and we can change that if we want. And then where do you want to push this to? For example, you can push to Azure Container Registry. And this is going to use your um, Windows Admin Center uh, Azure account that you configured uh, using Windows Admin Center to bring what are the subscriptions you have, so for example, here are the subscriptions I have in this account. And then what are the registries that are in place that I could push this image to? So I have three registries here. Uh, I can select which head registry I want to push this information to, and then just click push. And this is going to start the process of uploading my image from this container host to a centralized location running on Azure, right? So nice. this is now available for other container hosts and other Azure services. For example, Azure Kubernetes, Kubernetes service. Okay, that is awesome. Uh, now, obviously, like we have that container, we can, as you said, we can reuse it. Now, what I want to see is like, so let's use it. Let's let's mm -hmm. deploy it in production. Yes. Uh, before I show AKS or Azure Kubernetes service, the final thing I want to show in the Windows Admin Center is that we have Azure Container Instance. And what Azure Container Instance is, is as the name says, if you just want to run one simple instance of your container, you can do that. So let me show you this real quick. If I click Azure Container Registry, where my images are, I can open up my registries. And you, as you can see, I have multiple repositories with different tags. For some that are, this is the same image, just a different version. Let me take this, this one and run the option to Oops, oops, I think, I it, think it went, went away. away. <laughs> Select this one, one. Click, click run, run instance. instance, and this is and going this to is run the container instance, just like we ran in this container host, but on Azure Container Instance in this case. So you don't have to take care of the host now. You just, you just ask Azure, Azure to run the instance, and Azure will take care of everything for you. Oh, wow. What you okay. have to provide yeah. is the container name, uh, as you can see, the subscription is here. What is the resource group in that um, uh, in that subscription? I'm not, I'm not gonna run the process itself. I'm just showing what we have here. What is the location? Things that you would expect that Azure asks for, and then how many cores you wanna uh, use and how much memory. Uh, if you want a public IP address for this application or not, uh, in our case, we need one. And then what is the port you wanna expose for users to access your application? Okay. So wow. this very is very straightforward here. Yeah, I just want to say this is like super easy to actually now deploy a container in Azure Container Instance 
um, like just directly from Windows Admin Center. So this is yeah. awesome. Yeah, and from Azure Container Instance, from this view, as you can see, I already have one container running here. Here I have some basic management options. Like for example, I can stop this container or I can delete this container. If I need further management, I can click to manage it in Azure directly from Windows Admin Center. Awesome. All right, so with that, let's take a look at the Azure portal because now what we wanna do is we want to show how to run that container image that we just deployed into Azure Kubernetes service. So let's take a look at the registry itself. So I'm gonna show this Vinny Beer registry. As you can see here, just to show the process when it's analyzed from the Windows Admin Center side, the end result is that you have the image now pushed to the registry. And as you can see here, I have the V6, which is the sixth version of my application. I can click here and I even have the command that I can run on new hosts if I'm doing this through the command prompt um, to pull this image to that host. So this is the full address of my image now running in ACR. Right. So if I'm now sitting here, like I sit here on my desk, um, mm -hmm. I have Docker installed, I could basically go out and just like take that command and run your Vinny Beer application here on my desk. Or you can do it the easier way, which is installing Windows Admin Center and just giving the URL, which is this portion here, uh, yeah. until the, the column. And then V6 is the tag. So by providing this information, you can go to Windows Admin Center and pull the image way easier. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Oh, all right. So let's go back to the uh, dashboard. And what we want to do here is we want to create a new uh, AKS cluster or Azure Kubernetes Service cluster. To do that, you're going to run the, Azure, the usual process in Azure, right? So create a new resource, um, or you can uh, just click here uh, on the option of um, Kubernetes Services, and then select the option to add a new Kubernetes Service a Kubernetes cluster, and then follow the wizard to create the new cluster. Uh, I'm going to run this wizard until the end to explain uh, some of the capabilities in here and some of the options, but I'm not going to finalize because it takes a while to deploy a cluster and then deploy the application. I have it running already. So let's go through the process of deploying. First, of course, this is Azure, so you need to specify what is the subscription you want to use and what is the resource group. So I'm going to select the container uh, demo RG. The name of your cluster, so I'm going to call it test cluster. Uh, what is the region you want to deploy this? Availability zone for um, surviving a uh, disaster. Uh, what is the Kubernetes version you want to use? Uh, and this uh, dictates how much uh, uh, features or which features will be available for you. I'm gonna use a default one. And then one of the concepts in AKS is that you have a pool of servers to support your application and even the configuration of Kubernetes itself. By default, the primary node pool is a Linux node pool because this is configuring and running Kubernetes itself. So what we are going to specify for the primary node pool is just the size of the VMs that are, that are going to run and how many VMs you want in that pool of servers, right? Since our application is Windows, uh, we can keep the standard here. You can even change this configuration if you want, but for us, we are going to keep the standard. Next, we have the option to create new node pools. And we need to do that because as you can see, the primary one is Linux. So we need to create a new Windows one. So I'm gonna click the option to add a new one. I'm going to call it WX for Windows Server Pool. I'm going to say this is a user mode because this is going to run my application. It's not going to run any configuration for the Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, this is a Windows type. Uh, the availability zone, I can select which availability zones I want to use. The size of the nodes or the servers running in this pool. And this is the usual VM size that you have in Azure. Um, for the sake of the demonstration here, I'll select this standard one. 
node counts, so three servers per node. I can say four or five or how many servers I need. And how many pods that represent containers I can run per node. So the uh, maximum is 250 um, pods. So I'm going to add this. As you can see now, I have two uh, node pools, one for the system running Linux and one for my applications running Windows. Nice. Um, Next, on authentication, uh, I'm not going to go deep into authentication for Kubernetes because there are a gazillion options for managing authentication and how the Azure services are going to authenticate uh, against your Kubernetes cluster. The thing I wanted to say is we have two options, the service principle or system assigned managed identity. For service principle, what you want to do is you want to manually configure what is the service principle that is going to have access. For example, how do your uh, Kubernetes cluster access your container registry where you stored your image? You need to authenticate for that. So if you use service principle, you have to manually do that, but you have more granular options. If you use system assign uh, managed identity, Azure will take care of that for you, but then only for the um, resource group, and it's not as granular as service principle. I'm going to keep this one just for the sake of the demo. Sorry, Thomas, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, that, that's great. I, I, that's something I just learned something new that we have this new system assigned managed identity uh, and that this works with the resource group. So that I was not aware that it was limited to that. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm not entirely sure if it's limited. I think you can change later. Okay. But the default option is for the resource group. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Again, you have a bunch of other configuration here for RBAC, uh, integration with Active Directory and so on. Uh, let's go to networking. Since we have Windows nodes, we can't use KubeNet, which is the default uh, networking configuration for Kubernetes. We have to use the Azure CNI, at least for now. Uh, but basically what this does is this is going to configure an Azure network for the Kubernetes cluster and the application so they can, of course, communicate and so on and so on. Uh, in terms of integrations, here comes uh, the result of the authentication, like the container registry. Do you want to integrate with that? And I do. So I'm going to select the VinnyB registry that I just showed you. Uh, because they are in the same resource group, now I can actually go and have that uh, integration already configured. Next, I have tags that helps me manage uh, resources in Azure. I have the review and create, and everything looks fine. I can just go ahead and click create. But like I said, this process takes a few minutes to complete. So what I did was I created a cluster previously. So the end result of that creation process is this, is a fully working Kubernetes cluster that now you have uh, and you can manage um, either through a command prompt or the Azure portal itself. If you are familiar with Kubernetes, you know that one of the ways that you can connect to a Kubernetes cluster is using um, kubectl or kubectl or whatever you pronounce this. Uh, so one of the nice things about Azure is that it gives you the instructions on how to connect to this cluster, plus a few options for already going and managing um, AKS from uh, Azure Cloud, I'm um, sorry, uh, the, the the Cloud Shell or the Azure CLI um, yeah. directly. So let's take a look at a few things in here. So the first thing I want to show you is the node pools. All the configuration we specify during the uh, wizard are here. So you can see the WS pool, user, this is Windows, three nodes. I can go and take a look at the nodes itself or the scaling option for for these nodes, um, all the configuration that you would expect in here for managing uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Now, the question is, how do we deploy our application to AKS? Well, AKS follows the same deployment process for any Kubernetes cluster. To deploy an application in Kubernetes, instead of going through a wizard of deploying it, uh, you uh, also, you have, also to have to write a instructions file that tells you how to deploy the or tells Kubernetes how to deploy the application. Uh, and then uh, Kubernetes is going to take that uh, those parameters and run those instructions to deploy the containers to the nodes. The way you do that is specifying a YAML file 
And what I did was I prepared this one for this demo and I put it in my GitHub repo. So you can use this as a basis for your validation and testing. And quickly taking a look at this, as you can see, we have a deployment option here. Uh, we have some metadata information that describes my application. And then we have the specification of our deployment. And deployment is using for deploying containers itself. So here I have three replicas for the containers. I have metadata for the, uh, the application specifying which application to use uh, and specs for the container. So first we are saying that this is a Windows, this application, so it should run on a Windows node. And then the container itself, I'm giving it a name, I'm passing on what is the image that we are going to use, and then the resources itself. So how much CPU memory uh, in terms of limits as well as requests. So this is how much you can use tops and this is how minimal it's going to use when it's running. What are the ports that needs to be open? Uh, and then for a service that is actually the representation of the networking for your application, here we have an option for load balancer because remember we have three replicas. So you need to load balance the load into those three instances. So we are saying that this is using TCP uh, port 80 and the application that this is this should be deployed is Vinibir. Now, one of the cool features in AKS actually is that yeah, and providing all the commands to go and deploy this, we have an option here called workloads where you can see the workloads and even pass on a new YAML file. As you can see, this is a YAML editor. So what all I have to do is copy, oops, sorry, is copy the content from here to here and click add, and then uh, uh, AKS is going to deploy both the containers and the networking to this AKS cluster. Okay, so the YAML file really is like the like a declarative way of the configuration of the whole application. So if I would have also multiple containers for one application, if I need like a like a application server and a front end server, I could also specify that all in there, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. And I mean, I could separate, for example, one deployment for the deployment of the container, another YAML file just for the service. I'm just using one just for the sake of um, easier management and yep. um, so on. <laughs> one thing to keep in mind is the description on the YAML file calls out that same address that I explained later on, I'm sorry, uh, earlier on, uh, in the registry, right? So make sure that your image matches what you have in the registry. I'm going to cancel this because I already did this process. The end result of deploying this YAML file is this, right? So the Vinibeer application that you just saw me configure. Um, as you can see, there are other ones. These are all system uh, app kind of applications that are running in order for Kubernetes to simply work. Uh, but mine is also here. So if I click this application, I have some details here on how the application is actually uh, deployed. So as you can see, I have three desired replicas and they are there are three available. Uh, so everything seems to be running fine. I have the pods here that are exactly the containers that are running. So I can get a lot of details here on how my application is actually running. But the main thing I wanna show is that the application is actually running, right? So let's go to the services and ingress, because remember my YAML file described the application plus the server. Here you go, you have Vinibeer, the application, uh, deployed as load balancer. I have a cluster IP address, which is the IP address used by the cluster to access the service. And I have an external IP address, which is the IP address that is going to be used by my users to open the application. So if I go to this IP and I type in the address of my application itself, my application is up and running. Exactly the same application that we saw back at the beginning of the demo running on Windows Server 2008 R2, right? So just to prove that the application is still running fine, let's get your strong golden ale. <laughs> uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, five gallons, and the application runs just fine. Nice. So and now, like what I like, like you showed so many awesome things. So first of all, 
like how fast you actually can set up a Kubernetes cluster using AKS, right? Yeah. This is like, for me, still uh, absolutely awesome. And it kind of like, is a it is a managed service, um, which lets us run um, Kubernetes. And then the second thing, which I'm like, this is just a nice side effect. Now, this application you just showed me, it actually is now localized. So like you showed me to have these three instances. So now we have this like application. So if one node fails, that's something in the in the old days, I would actually have that run on a VM, and then I would have a virtual load balancing appliance or even a physical one to actually yep. do that. And I yep. need to do that all manually. Now you just basically describe that in that YAML file, which is, for me is absolutely awesome. Exactly. Um, like if, if, of, I, if I need more replicas yes. uh, from a host perspective, all I have to do is scale up the um, uh, the number of nodes in my uh, application pool. Uh, the yep. node pool that I that I showed, and if I need more containers, all I have to do is change the YAML file from three to four, or whatever yep. number you want to use, and redeploy. Right? Okay, that's pretty cool. I love that. I mean, this is like makes it obviously like also like, like we talked about the advantages of having like the scaling wise and all that, but now with that, we like I can see just another other benefit of that. Now, exactly. Now. We used like we used obviously Windows Admins that made it super easy to generate the Docker file and then generate the container image and then allow us that to push that to the container registry and from there uh, we could then create like we we had to build our YAML file um, to actually go out and, and deploy that to an AKS cluster or a Kubernetes cluster in general right mm -hmm. now wouldn't it be cool if if like Windows Admin Center could uh, help us creating that YAML file? Is there something in the pipeline? Yeah, th thanks for bringing that up, Thomas. Uh, if I can show you the demo flow that I just did, because it's a lot, so let's just recap what we did. So we had an existing .NET application running. Uh, what we did, the first process was to export the application and then using use Windows Admin Center to containerize the application. Then we pushed the container to Azure Container Registry. And then we started the process with the AKS cluster. Now, all the things you see in here on the left-hand side are supported by Windows Admin Center today. You can use Windows Admin Center to make this process easier. What we don't have yet is this option over here. How do I author the YAML file? Plus, how do I deploy that YAML file and the services and whatever it is uh, to AKS, right? And this is what we are working next. We are working on... Uh, a YAML authoring tool inside Windows Admin Center, plus the option to deploy to AKS and AKS HCI, which is a new release uh, in, in, in public preview uh, where you can run AKS on premises. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, we have a session uh, uh, in this event. So if you want to know more about it, go to itopstalks.ms uh, slash itopstalks. And there you will find the whole session on Azure, AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So I guess the whole workflow you just showed me is obviously now using like the Azure Container Registry and, and our Azure Kubernetes service running in Azure. But if I would go back and say, hey, I could not run for for different reasons, right? Network latency or data sovereignty reason. I could not mm -hmm. run it actually on AKS and Azure. Now with Azure Stack HCI, I could actually run it in my own data center and still use the same tooling and everything you just showed us. Yep, exactly. So the whole containerization process, it will work for both AKS and AKS HCI. And then it's just a deployment option. At deployment time, you can say, where is the destination you want to go to? Oh, that's awesome. That is really, really awesome stuff. Like this makes it like I can't wait. I will I, I have a couple of old applications here running. I will definitely <laughs> try this out and like see if I can I can containerize them and put them on AKS. Um yep. so I can actually save some power here at home. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Um with that. Um, I definitely like always want to learn more now to prepare actually for um, uh, like exactly for my migration, right? And if others like the viewers of this video, if they want to learn more, uh, where do they go? Yeah. So I put some links in here. The first one is the ka.ms slash containers. This is the link to our documentation. And just recently, we updated the whole documentation to include Windows Admin Center. 
So we have new tutorials there explaining how to deploy the containers extension, how to deploy uh, Docker itself and configure the host if you don't have it pre-configured. So you should, if you just have an installation of Windows Server and you want to transform that into a container host, you can use Windows Admin Center to actually do that. Um, how to pull images, run images, manage images, um, create new images, uh, run on Azure with ACI, push it to ACR. Everything is now documented in uh, in this link. Oh, awesome. The next one is aka.ms slash containers feedback. This is our GitHub repo. Uh, it doesn't have any code, but it does allow people to go and create new issues. Those issues, uh, we triage those. So if you have a bug, if you have a question, if you have a suggestion, um, go to this link, create a new issue, and let us know what's going on. Uh, the product team is looking at those issues and working with our uh, community and users and customers to understand what they need, what's working, what's not. Um, and it's a nice channel for, uh, for for communicating with us. This is awesome. I, I love that. And I can, I just want to quickly highlight this um, because when I was not working for Microsoft and it was like really like in the back in Windows Server 2003, for example, mm -hmm. days and, and so on, I was like, I was setting up Active Directory for some customers and stuff like that. And I was like, I, I run into issues and bugs, right? And I was like, I, I don't even bother telling uh, Microsoft that because like, why would they listen to me, right? And <laughs> <laughs> that is like, since I joined Microsoft and even before that, that is actually like one of the biggest mistakes I made because uh, really the product groups are listening to that feedback. They want to know what is working, what is not working. Um, so please, please, please take that opportunity, provide feedback, especially if the container teams offers that. So if you try this out now by yourself, and you run into issues or you have like something you don't understand, I guess they can also write you if there's like documentation missing, if they have a missing piece or a question like, and that would also help us obviously fix those things as well to make sure that they have all the resources they need, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, two things, uh, please contact me. I have my Twitter here. Uh, you can contact me there. Um, but also the documentation is all open source. If you have feedback on the documentation itself, you can write your feedback directly in the documentation. So also, you can also try that as well. Awesome. No, this is great. Great stuff. Uh, I'm really happy to have you on this video and in this session. So really appreciate your time here. Thank you very much, Vinicius. Uh, great to having you. No, thanks, um, Thomas, for having me. And uh, again, great partnership here. Awesome. Thank you very much. And for all of you who have like watched this session and want to learn more, we have obviously all the links uh, in the description below. So you can find the links to the documentation, to the feedback uh, hub, um, where you can provide your feedback. And if you want to watch more sessions, for example, also on Azure Stack, uh, on AKS, on Azure Stack HCI, um, on other hybrid sessions as well, check out aka.ms slash talks, and you will go to our little event website where you can find all the other sessions and what's going on with that event. Thank you very much for viewing that session. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks.